or good afternoon, depending on what area of the country that you're calling in from. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, attending and taking your time today. Uh, hopefully we will present to you some very important information for uh, auto dealerships and cybersecurity concerns and issues and the forensics aspect of that. I'll go ahead and introduce myself briefly and then I'll let Anders introduce himself. My name is Calvin Weeks. I'm the manager of digital forensics, e-discovery and cybersecurity incident response. Been doing this for more than 25 years, actually more than 30 years now. Um, and right now our practice is, is uh, keeping us very busy with the various different breaches and security uh, concerns of uh, many different types of organizations and auto dealerships being one of them. Anders, I'll let you pick that, take that up. Yeah, uh, this is Anders. I'm, I'm Anders Erickson. I am the, the principal in charge of our cybersecurity services here at I Bailey. So uh, my primary uh, role is to bring together the people at the table who can help organizations uh, be prepared for cybersecurity. So whether it's our incident response team or our, um, our managed services team and our security engineers, whether it's our risk assessors or penetration testing team, uh, we'll go in with a client and we will perform a risk assessment that identifies where risks are and then bring solutions to the table that'll help to remediate those risks and reduce the risks, which make clients feel more comfortable about the cybersecurity investments they're making. Uh, I've been doing this for 15 years, been with Hyde Bailey for about six years now. Thank you, Anders. All right, so, you know, professionals with dealerships across the country are all agreeing as of course, uh, across other industries as well, that it's just a matter of time until the next breach occurs. Various different things are happening now, you know, in different types of businesses and, and what you do. We see auto dealerships now going online and they're collecting a lot more consumer information and in some cases a lot more than banks. So the breach notification laws are now in every single state. So if something occurs, if there's a, an event, there are different regulations that require you to report that um, to various different authorities within each state. So you know, we're hoping that you uh, listen to what we have to say and learn and educate yourself on hopefully you not becoming the next victim of the attacks that are out there. But if you are, then hopefully you're going to be better prepared to deal with what that is and hopefully minimize the impact to your business. And let's start by understanding what that impact is. We want to understand how bad is it? How does it happen? What are the best practices approaches? and then the cybersecurity services that you would deploy those services with. So how bad is it? We know in 2017, the cyber attacks cost small to medium sized business on average about $2.2 million. Small and medium sized businesses can't sustain and stay in business uh, with $2.2 million losses, or at least I don't know many of them that can. So there's got to be some kind of cyber liability coverage that helps with that. And what we see with that is 60% of small, small companies that suffer, you know, some type of cyber breach or cyber attack goes out of business within the first six months. But for auto dealerships, nearly 84% of the consumers would not buy another car from a dealership that had a security breach at that dealership. And we also know that approximately 33% of consumers are not confident in the security of their personal and financial data when buying a vehicle at a dealership. Maybe just one one comment there, uh, Calvin. You know, we saw in the news this last week where there was a significant breach of data from dealerships that uh, had recently per or people who recently purchased cars. And so, having purchased a car myself recently, I'm really interested to see exactly what exactly happened, where the data came from. But I, I see from the you see from the media that that when the breach happens, they are quick to kind of point out, well, where did this come from, and who's who whose data is uh, being impacted, and so when you target it, or when a target hits a particular industry like the dealership industry, it really can have an impact on where people are going to go and how they're going to buy. And especially something like that, the repeat buyers, people who are not willing to buy another car uh, from a dealership that has a security breach. Uh, you know, the, a lot of dealerships live on repeat buyers and people coming back and making recommendations. And so that reputation is important. Yeah, thank you, Anders. So easy targets, um, dealerships fall into this. 49% of victims who were successfully attacked are attacked again within one year. I see this with my practice because I'm the one that respond to the breaches and help investigate these issues. And 
uh, a lot of times whenever we give our recommendations and our best practices, those organizations that do not follow them and take them seriously are very often hit again within the next year. Some of the ways that those are handled, some of the, way that you, the ways that you respond to those can encourage an attacker to come back. Um, it takes an assist, a sophisticated ha hacker about six minutes to break into a dealership Wi-Fi network. I, I'd like to, I, I don't want to leave the, with the impression that dealerships are, are just not secure. Dealerships are different than, say, a bank or a financial institution, whereas a bank and financial institution, I mean, it, it's limited about what they want their consumers to be able to get onto their networks. Whereas dealerships, you want it to be very inviting and very welcoming. So uh, a lot of times the Wi-Fi uh, at the dealerships are, are open, but there are very, very specific best practices to help curb that. But right now, th that's not being happening either to save money or save cost. Dealerships are placing those Wi-Fi networks and, con and connecting them directly to their core networks, which is allowing data breaches to happen. From a hacker's perspective, it's much easier to hack a dealership than it is a bank. So the means of compromise, 49% of malware is installed via mal malicious email attachments. A lot of attacks come by email. Those, that, that is one of the most common methods. Uh, there are vulnerabilities on systems and things like that, but at the end of the day, the only way that you're going to attack Fort Knox is to convince somebody that can get in to, to help you know to help help you get in whether than knowingly or unknowingly so a lot of times the more security you have the, the your vulnerabilities become your users they they become your number one threat either intentionally or accidentally so over 80% of all of all attacks involve some form of social engineering attack method uh, they do this by tricking and convincing you to allow them a means to compromise your system or identity and we see this quite often Anders, you provide that service. Uh, are you seeing any any kind of trends that are negating that, or that making that less of an issue, or is it becoming more of an issue? Yeah, and we're going to talk about that a little later in the presentation because the the what, what we've found is that organizations they invest all this money in cybersecurity. They're getting firewalls. They've got smart people setting these up, but it all gets bypassed by a user, and so you can have a user who bypasses all the investment you've made. And so we're seeing a trend where organizations are starting to invest more in education and training, uh, where, where they're investing more in uh, phishing exercises so that organizations, the people in your organization know what a phishing email looks like. There's sort of these telltale signs of what a phishing it looks like. So there's, there's things organizations are starting to do because the people are the weakest link. And they are the what because we're all human make mistakes. That's where the hackers are going after. They're going after the people because that's where they know they're going to get the easiest route of getting into a system. Yeah, absolutely. It just takes you know one weak link, you know, even inadvertently or accidentally, to let somebody in. To make matters worse, on average, it takes 101 days to detect a malware infection. Um, there's a misunderstanding about malware. They're thinking that when I get my machine gets infected by a virus, it's going to malfunction. It's going to stop working or, or this. And it's, that's very contrary. Most of the malware nowadays are not designed necessarily to uh, do specific damage. It's designed to allow the, uh, the intruders, the hackers, to remotely gain access and to gain control over that system. And a lot of times they will get in and, and they will fix problems for you. They want to make sure that that system stays up and running and they always have access. So a lot of times it becomes very difficult to detect, you know, these different types of infections. It takes on average about 12 months to detect a hacker has access to your network. Um, in 12 months, a hacker can steal a lot of information and lay a lot of groundwork so that if you do detect that they're there, it becomes very difficult to get them out without completely replacing and rebuilding your entire network and every computer you have. And that's where the costs kind of go through the roof if you're not careful. On average, it takes more than three years to become aware that your identity has been stolen. There's a lot of times identities, the, the data that gets stolen from different various organizations, uh, they go to the black market to get sold. And sometimes that takes anywhere from three months to six months to get on the black market. And then by the time somebody buys that information and then actually uses it, it could be a year to two years. And then, of course, not everybody looks at their credit report on a regular basis. So that's where you can easily see that three years or more is, is not unreasonable to understand it. For my identity to get stolen, I may not realize it right away. 
And it often takes dealership longer to discover the breach. And that on average for uh, car dealerships, it's an average of 208 days. So our first, first polling question, what is the percentage of small companies that suffer a cyber attack that are out of business within six months? So the correct answer was 60%. It's 60% of, of small companies that go out of business within the first six months of uh, suffering a cyber attack. And it's pretty significant. And, and uh, I am aware of some of those businesses that, that get hit like that and, and go out of business. Uh, sometimes it takes uh, multiple attacks, but small businesses are suffering. And even some of the larger businesses, um, it, it's, it's a major impact, a major blow to their operations. So how does this happen? We can just understand how this happens. Well, it's malware. We talked about the phishing and, and how does this happen? And again, there's, there's a misunderstanding that there's some super elite, elite hacker that's setting down writing these viruses and doing all this stuff. Um, no, not at all. This is a website. I'm not giving you the URL on purpose. Uh, so, but just understand this is a, this is a public website. It is not illegal. They're not doing anything illegal at all. And all they're doing here is on a, on a daily basis, they scan the entire internet for machines that are infected with various different malware and viruses and different things like that. One of them could be your machine today. And they publish it out here for the purposes of system administrators. You can go out here and you can you can watch this list to make sure none of your machines are showing up on here as being infected. Because again, you got to do everything you can to try to detect that you're infected as early as possible. And this is one method. It shouldn't be the only method you use. Well, okay, here's all the information to all the malware, all the infections that are out there. All a hacker's got to do is find the right malware, the right virus that they're looking for, use that URL. So maybe if you're one of these machines that are infected, a hacker goes out and sees that your machine is infected and then they're going to go and distribute that attack using your infected machine to try to compromise other people. So they all they got to do is just look on here and look for the particular virus that they're looking for, send out that phishing email or whatever there is that, that they're going to do to try to, to deploy that malware and get it on somebody else's machine or, or thousands of machines at one time. Very easy to do, very, very not very difficult at all. So some phishing examples. Um, here's uh, some, they're kind of rudimentary. They're getting a lot more sophisticated right now, but some of the things you want to look for is obviously who is it from, make sure that it's legitimate, but then if there's any links, making sure that the links line up with what you're expecting, and then obviously if they don't match, like in this particular example, it's supposed to be from the irs.gov, but then why would, uh, why would the IRS uh, from, from the United States be sending you to a, a Canadian uh, website, um, highly suspicious. You know, one other thing on that, one other thing on that is that if you can just sort of take it as a blanket statement. If you're ever giving an email from the IRS telling you to, and asking you to do something, and especially if they're asking you to do it urgently, you can know that it's, it's always going to be a, a, a malicious attack. The IRS sends out mail. They're still using snail mail. They rarely, if ever, contact people through email. And if they do, you're going to get something in the mail as well. So, um, don't ever feel, especially if there's if there's a sense of urgency in the email, uh, it, it's always sort of a telltale sign of, well, maybe I better check something out or get somebody on the phone and understand what it is that I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, but the IRS will never reach out to you with an email. Yeah, absolutely. Here's another example, uh, again, a little bit more sophisticated where the link that they put here, when you hover over it, it actually uh, shows a different URL. That's another sign that, that they may be trying to fish you or attack you. And then the last example, the PayPal, uh, again, looking at this one, a lot of times that they will send you to legitimate websites, um, but they'll, they'll divert you and for a man in the middle uh, type of attack. So the recommendations, you know, the things that I like to say for phishing, um, and I tell my friends, my family, or any of my clients that I talk to, you know, any more, if you receive an email, even if it's somebody from that you somebody you know, uh, even especially if it's somebody that you know, if it's not something that you're expecting, it's not something that you would normally receive from them, or it just looks odd. If you know that per person, just pick up the telephone and call them on a number that you 
are familiar and how to contact them and ask them if they sent you something like that. Otherwise, just completely ignore it. And I do that, you know, even for my wife or, or anybody that if I'm not expecting something, I'm not clicking on anything, I'm not downloading, I'm not looking at anything. I'm double checking before before I do it. Because a very common attack is if my machine or my email gets compromised, they're actually going to use my real email address to send to my real contacts pretending to be me to further distribute their attacks. So they're getting very sophisticated and very smart about how they do that to be most successful. So we know that human, her human error is uh, a you know, a very serious concern in cybersecurity. Uh, any, anybody from, you know, the simple users, everyday users to even your technology uh, experts, your, your senior network and system administrators, to your managers and executives. Um, inadvertent, a human error kind of thing is really what's causing a lot of problems. Um, so we say, you know, a large threat is, you know, to any organization is their internal users, not from the perspective that you hire bad people. It's just, we're all human. Uh, we all make that mistake. We all look at, you know, an email saying, oh, this is for my buddy, you know, Jim, and I'm going to click on it to see what he sent me. And lo and behold, then you get infected. And a lot of times you don't even realize it. So Human error is a is a major concern in cybersecurity and has been for quite a while, and I don't see that going away anytime soon. So, even if you think you're doing really good security, the the inadvertent things will get you in trouble. Anders, you know, and I think this has uh, escalated in the in the dealership world because there is there are so many people who are are part of a dealership, whether it's in sales or working the shop, and so how much do each of these individuals interact with systems and how much do they need to understand the risk that they pose? And so if you've got someone who's working on the shop floor and they're having a shared computer that they all use, they all log into the same computer to look things up. Well, what do they do? What else are they doing on that? Does that computer have the ability to, um, to go onto the internet? Uh, do, are they, can they check their email on that? Because now you've got, you've got people in the shop that sure they don't use a lot of computers or maybe they're just working on cars all day, but if they have the ability to go check the email, they could expose your organization to, these types of malware attacks. And so the, the really consideration needs to be given to how much time do we need to be spending teaching and educating each one of our different types of employees um, based on the risk they pose to the organization. So uh, there, I think I see dealerships a lot more kind of just not saying, let's blanket everybody and everybody has to take this security awareness training, but, or, or, but let's make sure we target the people who are posing the greatest risk to our organization. So it's really a risk-based approach to uh, who, who, who exposes us to risk. Yeah, very good. So ransomware, um, again, this is still pretty prevalent out there. There's a lot of attacks. Uh, dealerships are no exception to this. The majority of ransomware uh, infections usually come from the management upper executive level, possibly even boards, board members. Um, Attackers know that that getting to the executives is probably where you're going to find that first human error because a lot of times, as management, depending on on how sophisticated that attack is and how how you know very well written the email or the communication is to infect that machine, they know it's the executives that they got to hit first. Um, so ransomware, we're seeing that you know targeting the the upper level management of that, and they're being very successful in that. So. The, the question that I always get once I get a client that calls me that's been affected with uh, the ransomware, the malware kind of stuff is, should they pay or should they not? Well, regardless of whether you de decide to pay or not, I would caution you that, that you know, one of the things that's happening here is this, this criminal is now asking you for money. If you don't pay them, they could take offense to that. And when you clean up and you get back up and running, they're just going to come back at you harder. If you do pay, maybe the message that you've given them is that one, you pay, and two, you don't have very good security. So then they'll distribute your information to other hackers and they'll come and, you know, uh, infect your machines with a ran another ransomware in the future. So take your security very seriously if you ever get infected with uh, ransomware because they're very serious about just getting money and they'll do everything they can to just annoy you and cost money where it's cheaper, just pay them 
whatever it is that they're asking for. And there's two different two different you know ways that I've seen that uh, the ransomware um, their strategies. Uh, a lot of times, if they're not familiar with the company, they'll do some small amount, a uh, small amount around you know anywhere between a thousand to five thousand um, dollars. And a lot of times, you know, businesses they'll just pay that. Well, you say, well, they're not making very much money. Well, if they if they've done that ten thousand times, ten thousand different organizations, and even if they get ten percent of that, that's a pretty good you know amount of money for uh, one day's worth of work of not doing very much. Whenever they get to what they know, they do their homework and they get, you know, uh, a, a large business or a, a business that deals with large amounts of cash, you know, such as hospitals, some auto dealerships, you will see then that they'll ask for the hundred thousand, the five hundred thousand dollar ransom. Another concern uh, that's been growing, and now we're seeing more and more of it, the ransomware is only part of the attack. Um, a lot of times now we're seeing that the attackers will actually copy all the data off before they actually lock up your systems. So even if you find uh, a good backup and you restore everything, the hackers already have all of your data and then they'll, just, they'll either ransom that off as well because then it's not gonna be a restore. You, you have to understand they have your data. So that's becoming you know, very popular as well. They hold you hostage because they have your data. And if that information gets out, that could damage your reputation and you could lose, lose business and lose clientele. Another one, that, another one that we're seeing is this wire fraud um, that goes along with, again, the same type of ransomware type of attacks, the way they do that. Um, you can see here as an example that they'll usually pretend uh, to be some executive or some executive assistant, and they'll send it to the right people to basically get a wire transfer sent to, uh, sent to their bank as opposed to something legitimate. Um, happens all the time. Uh, we're very trusting. Um, you know, for my boss, my boss would ask me to do anything. I'll do, you know, I'll do anything legally to to help him out to make sure that I can, I can get whatever he's asking for done. If it's something unusual, but what's unusual about, you know, the boss asking uh, the financial person accounts payable or whatever to make a transfer on an account is not necessarily unusual. And if you don't have the controls in place, we're seeing the, this type of an attack uh, quite common and some serious um, serious dollars too. Um, some of the stuff that we're seeing is in upwards of uh, half a million to $5 million in wire transfers. Um, and a lot of times they don't do it necessarily once, they'll do it multiple times. Uh, Cause they'll get, as long as they're gonna get away with it and you're gonna keep sending the money, they're gonna, they're gonna keep doing it. Um, so unfortunately we see a lot of people fall victim to this just because they don't have the controls in place to to double check everything. Um, a lot of times banks will help you with this as well. So if you're going to do some kind of ACH transfer or large sums of money, um, a lot of times banks will help either have a system in place uh, to double check that before they transfer the money, but you have to set that up with them and it's an additional services from, from banks. Second polling question. Mid-level managers and higher account for what percentage of ransomware victims in the workplace? Mid-level managers or higher account for what percentage of ransomware victims? 80% was the correct answer. Um, a very high percentage of, of executives, uh, upper level management are getting compromised with ransomware. So. Pay attention if you're in the upper level management, mid-level and not higher, uh, pay attention. You, you are definitely being targeted. All right, next I'm gonna turn it over to Anders and let him take the lead on the best practices approach so that you can get a better understanding of what are the things you need to be doing to prevent some of these things that occur. Thanks, Callan. Hey, and everybody, I just, I just um, up on the, the chat, I just copied in a link to an article from Forbes about this recent data breach. If you hadn't had, had a chance to look at it or heard about it, um, there was 198 million car buy buyers records that were exposed. Um, this, this, the, the breach actually occurred or was discovered in August, but wasn't made public until recently and um, just like last week. And so there's some articles on it. Um, it. It brings up some interesting questions in the cybersecurity world, specifically for dealerships. 
Um, the, and, and the one, one big question you kind of can just consider as you're looking at that is who are we sharing our data with? Where we've got um, customers coming in, they're trusting us with a lot of financial data and they are signing certain disclosures that allow us to share that data, but who are we really passing it along to? And think about the competitive advantage that might serve you to be able to talk to your customers about the privacy that you have and the, with their data and how you handle that and secure it. So anyway, just food for thought. All right, so let's talk about some best practices for cybersecurity. We've, uh, over the last uh, four years, we've been working closely, my cybersecurity team has been working closely with Calvin and his incident response team. And, um, oh, Jim, you're saying you can't see the link. I'll make sure I can, if I, I send it up there, if you can't see it, oh, I got it. I got what I did wrong. You should be able to see it now. I sent it to all the panelists, but Calvin already has it, so you should see it now. The, we've been working closely with Calvin's team in the last uh, three or four years, really looking at, well, when a company is breached, when an organization experiences a data breach or a, a malware infection, what could they have done? What are the things they could have done that would have saved them from all that hassle and, and, and cost? And, and based on the information we've received from Calvin and working with his team, we've come up with this best practice approach to cybersecurity. Uh, the idea here being that if you as an organization implement some of these foundational securities and critical processes, you're putting yourself up into a place where you would stop or, or significantly reduce the, the risks of a breach is, uh, of occurring. And if you did get a breach, it would significantly reduce the impact of that. And so what we want to do today is talk through these because cybersecurity, we, oftentimes people come in and say, well, you need to have a policy or you need to buy this tool. And, and tools and policies are good, but what we want to help you do today is see that there's a, there's, a, there's a framework to this. There's an approach that can help you really implement the foundational things that, that any organization should do um, that'll, that really would keep you out of the news from a breach perspective. So let's talk about this stage one first. So I'm going to break down each of these. There's seven specific activities that make up stage one. These are the foundational security principles. So the first thing is administrative access. Organizations, they, when they set up their systems, they kind of uh, often will set up the, with, with people who have the administrative access that will be able to uh, create new users and will be able to install new software. And those administrative users are important to being able to manage the system, but not everybody needs to be an administrator. And the people who have administrative access should be very limited in, in the times that they're getting in there and using that administrative access. And, um, and it should only be really limited to IT personnel. So, uh, and even when, if you have an IT personnel, they shouldn't be getting into their admin account all the time. They, maybe they're just going in and doing general um, activities that don't require an administrative account. So maybe having two accounts, so they're not getting into it all the time. But what we found in the research is that 97% of all Microsoft vulnerabilities, Microsoft does the, and it does Windows and they do the Office 365 and Microsoft Office, they can, 97% of their known vulnerabilities could be mitigated by reducing administrative access rights. If I'm, an, if, I'm attack, if I'm a hacker, one of the first things I'm gonna do is try to get administrative access because that's gonna allow me to then install my malware, propagate my malware throughout the network. So really looking at how is the organization handling administrative access, are you reducing it as much as you can so only those critical people need to do, need, who, who need it have it, and even then, we're protecting those administrative access credentials very well. So that's the very first thing. Um, the second thing uh, in stage one is having data backup and recovery. What we see is that when we have ransomware attacks, there are increasing in, 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 in not only frequency, but in cost. Uh, they are a very easy way for hackers to exploit and, and utilize their hacking skills to get money. Um, but one of the greatest things you can do to prevent or, or to respond to ransomware is to have good data backups because ransomware, when ransomware comes in, it basically, the, the malware just propagates itself throughout the network and encrypts everything it can find. And the only way you can unencrypt that is if you've got the key. Well, the hacker has the key. They're going to say, I'm not going to give you the key to unlock this data that I've encrypted unless you pay me. Well, if you've got backups, you can say, well, I don't care if you, you pay, I don't care if you pay, if you unlock it. I've already got my data backups. You can restore your data right over your old data, the, the encrypted data. So we're, we're finding that backups are becoming critical to security and, uh, of data and systems uh, going forward. So making sure you've got good backup in place, that it's timely, 
uh, and then you test those backups to make sure that you can recover the data from them. The, the next, uh, the, the third thing in the stage one of foundational security is an email is email gateway security. Uh, more than 90% of cybersecurity attacks start with the phishing email, and, and, and Calvin's talked to you about what those phishing emails are, they look like. But just to give you an idea of how these attacks work, this, I just wanted to kind of show you this flow chart of the attack. First, the, the user gets a, a, a malicious link that's like embedded in an email, or it's an attachment in an email. And when they click on that email, or when they open that attachment, it's going to basically, there's going to be something in there, a little piece of software that's going to direct the ha be directed to the hacker's website, and, 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 they're, and, and they're not going to know where they're going. It's going to look like a legitimate website, um, but they're, it's going to say, oh, log in here to see where your package is for, for, um, for uh, UPS. So they're going to log in, and, that, but, and so they've given their credentials to a, a user or to a, to a malicious person. Another way we see this a lot is that if your organization uses Office 365, uh, we'll see hackers impersonate a system administrator and say, "Hey, your Office 365 credentials uh, need to be need to be updated, or we need to push out a new update. Please enter your username and password here." And well, the user enters their Office 365 username and password, or their Windows username and password, and now that hacker has the, that username and password. But once they get access, once they get those credentials, they're going to begin exploiting and, and carefully, slowly moving through the network. We're going to deploy their malware. But the, what we learn is the email and the web scanning are critical uh, to that security. And uh, you can think of an email gateway as kind of like a stoplight. Everything that's any emails that are coming in, any data that's coming in through email, it it stops it and says, "Let me look at this and see if it's malicious." And and and, and so it no, it can it can protect and it can identify and protect your organization from a lot of attacks before they even get to a user's inbox. Or so tools like Mimecast, uh, like Proofpoint, these are email gateways that, that will allow your organization to stop a lot of these attacks before they even get to your organization. So the fourth thing in stage one is organizations that are successful against cyber attacks, they perform email phishing exercises. Uh, this is the idea of we're gonna train our people what an email phishing, what an email phishing looks like. Uh, we, we, we perform these services for organizations in which we basically mimic what a hacker would do we have software that basically sends a, an email to your employees uh, and tries to get them to click on a link or open an attachment or give their credentials. And, and, and if, they, if they're one of the ones who fall victim to this, well, they get to take five minutes of security awareness training. And so you're targeting the people who don't quite understand it. And over time, we, we, you know, we'll, start, we'll see organizations begin with a, you know, a, a 20 or sometimes 30% fail rate. Uh, where where thirty percent of the people who get this email are clicking on the links, and and but over time we can bring that down to under ten percent, maybe even down to seven or eight percent, and so you're reducing risk significantly, and now you can target just those areas that those people who are are a particular risk. So, making sure you're, you're ongoing and creating uh, an environment where people understand or are educated about what it, phishing emails look like. Well, let's take a break here, and we're we're four out of the seven on the uh, of the. Uh, principles of the, the, the fundamental cybersecurity. Let's take a break here and talk about or and ask this question. More than 90% of cyber attacks start with what? A phishing email, hacked passwords, a misleading link, or none of the above? You know, and that, I, I guess to some degree, that question was a little misleading too, because there could be a misleading link in an email phishing, a phishing email. So they, um, so they're, that, that, I wouldn't say that third one's necessarily wrong either. So, but yes. 90% of cyber attacks start with uh, a phishing email. It's just the easiest way for hackers to get in and begin to uh, penetrate an organization's network. So now we're gonna talk about uh, a piece of software that should be deployed on every workstation within your organization. So if I've got a dealership and I've got 10 locations or I've got three locations, this endpoint protection should be on every single workstation. Uh, what we found is that more and more attacks take place uh, with uh, at a workstation, uh, uh, trying to trick a user or trying to deploy software on a, on, a, on a particular workstation, not on the servers or on the firewalls. It's really things are happening at the what we call the endpoint. Uh, and the endpoint, you know, we, we, it was really just a workstation or a computer. We call it an endpoint because if you've got a piece of network traffic. 
the end point is where the destination is. If I'm communicating with somebody and they're sending me an email, well, the end point is my computer. That's where it's coming to. So we've got this software now um, called Endpoint Protection. This will seem a lot like antivirus. You might have heard of antivirus software like Norton or McAfee. Well, those are what we call sort of just traditional um, antivirus software. And the way that they work is that they take a, a, they look for what are called signatures. And these signatures are just sort of uh, the, what a file looks like, its name, its, uh, what it, what it particular um, attributes that that file has that, that indicate that that file is a piece of malware. And so they've got these huge, these old, older antivirus software, these huge repositories of all these signatures of what a potential piece of malware looks like. The problem is that there's new malware coming out all the time. And so these older antivirus systems have to constantly be updating with new signatures. And if there's something that's uh, a new piece of malware uh, or a, something that a hacker just developed themselves and, and, and coded themselves, these signatures might not see it. So what we're seeing is a transition to this sort of next generation endpoint protection. And on the screen here, you'll see a bunch of different vendors. And these are companies that have invested in a new way to identify malware that's not signature based, but is really based more on behavior and how the computer is acting and what, what things are happening behind the scenes, the processes are running that could indicate that there is a breach there. And, and so there's a number, as you can see, there's a number of vendors out there, but this software is critical because it is much more proactive. It is much more able to not only identify a piece of malware or a virus, but it can isolate it and it can say, well, it, infected this one computer, but we're not gonna let it infect anything else so it can block off the other computers around or the other network. Um, and so transitioning from a traditional malware to one of these next generation endpoint protection is very important for organizations. And there's a lot of different, um, like I said, there's a lot of vendors out there, uh, but find the one that's right for you because they have different price points, they have different areas that are strengths, Some, something like silence, really focuses on artificial intelligence and looking for um, the, or understanding what the traffic normally looks like coming in and out of a computer. So when it changes, when the traffic changes to something that's not normal, it's, it, it, it'll, it'll identify that sort of behavior and it'll do some sort of analytical, like they call it artificial intelligence to understand something changed. Somebody like Webroot uh, tends to be a little less expensive. It's not quite as advanced as Silence or Carbon Black. Uh, but it 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 uh, it still is. We've had we've had organizations that have deployed Webroot that have really been able to lock out a workstation and really save themselves from a lot of I'm sorry locked out a workstation that was infected and saved themselves a lot of hassle from letting that software propagate that malware propagate. So getting an endpoint protection in place is going to be critical. We got two more in our foundational security. The next one is the firewall with security services. A lot of organizations we see a lot of dealerships who um, have not updated their firewalls in, in a while. So they're dealing with, or they've got deployed a, a firewall that's a little bit older technology. The idea behind a firewall is that the, at, at the edge of your network, you install a firewall. And that firewall basically watches what goes in and out of, the, uh, of your network and stops anything that could be malicious. Um, older firewalls are limited in, in what they can look for and how deep they can go into the and into the information system packets that are passing back and forth on a firewall. So you've, if you get a firewall with security services, some of the sort of these next generation firewalls, they are much better at isolating issues, pulling out data that is malicious out of a packet, um, only letting through things that are, um, that are safe. And so if your organization hasn't upgraded to sort of a business grade um, next generation firewall, you really should be looking to do that. And these are not, at this point, some of them, you know, depending on the size of your organization, they don't get too expensive. So it's just a matter of understanding where you are and transitioning to a new one and making sure uh, you've got someone who understands how to deploy it, setting it up. Yeah, Anders, the thing I would say about deploying a firewall is <clears throat> use the, the, the rule of least privilege. Um, if it's not needed, don't, don't have it in there. So, in, you know, buying a firewall and just going with the default uh, settings may not be uh, the best way of doing that. And the example that uh, I've used for previous clients is like uh, getting the best, uh, you know, door lock on your door and issuing out keys 
to your employees. And then as those employees leave and go somewhere else, you never get the keys back. Uh, you need to look at that on a regular basis and change the, the lock, change the firewall, if you will, uh, to accommodate and to only allow in what you're supposed to allow in uh, as, right. as your business change, that changes too. Right. And the, to your point, Calvin, those, uh, that, I, that principle of least privilege or least access is just, well, you can see the picture here. We've, on, the, on the left side, we've got a bunch of stuff coming through, some of which has these malicious little symbols on it. And the firewall is blocking those malicious things from coming through. And if you take a firewall right out of the box, it's going to have some things turned on you might not want turned on or letting some things through you might not want to let through. So having someone who understands how to set that up is going to be important for your business needs. The last thing is uh, we really can't stress enough is multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is the idea that there's more than one thing that identifies me to a computer system. You, traditionally, we've come and said, you want to log on to the system, you have to have a password. And that password is that single factor. And if someone knows that password, they can get on and basically impersonate you. The dual or the multi-factor authentication basically says, well, we need at least two things to identify you. And so in addition to your password, maybe what we want you to do is have like, uh, you see maybe seen like uh, some organizations will have a pin sent to your phone. They've got your cell phone on file. And when you try to log in, it's gonna send a pin to your phone and you've got to enter that pin. Well, now it's something you know, your password, and something you have on the bottom right there in the circle. So you've got your phone. Only someone who had their phone would be able to see that pin and enter that pin. We also see things like uh, a combination of a password and then so, like a fingerprint. You know, a lot of laptops nowadays will have a little fingerprint scanner. Well, that gives you that second factor. I, I can only log in if I've got a password and my fingerprint. So there's, uh, but what we found is that if you've implemented multi-factor authentication, you significantly reduce your risk of a data breach. I mean, we're talking about like 95%, 98% reduction in risk because the, the, the hacker has to have two pieces of information and that is so difficult to get. So uh, look at your organizations, identify, well, are we we're using multi-factor authentication? It's not always available in all systems and all app, like applications, but there's a lot of places where it is, it's becoming more popular. And where it is, educate your people and, 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 and roll this out and begin utilizing because it'll save you a lot of hack, ha hassle when it comes to security. All right, so stage one really focuses on those foundational security. We've talked about those seven things. Once you've got those seven things in place, first of all, don't, don't worry about anything until you've got those seven things in place. Those are foundational. But once you've got those seven things in place, then start looking at some critical processes, some key processes that you can put in place. And we have identified three key processes uh, that we wanna just kind of introduce to you today. The first key process is called vulnerability management. And the idea here is that every piece of software, no matter how great it is, has vulnerabilities. When Microsoft Windows, has millions of lines of code, and there's vulnerabilities in there that Microsoft could never identify. And so they're constantly coming out with patches and updates to make sure that their, 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 their software is updated and, and fixing some of the vulnerabilities they have. So as organizations, we need to understand where our vulnerabilities are, either through third-party software or the way that we're configuring, configuring, our, configuring our network. So this is a process we help organizations establish to begin managing their vulnerabilities. And, it's, and, and one step builds on the next. So the first thing is creating an asset inventory. You gotta know what you have before you can begin protecting it. So getting an inventory of your software, getting an inventory of your hardware. Um, this can be, for some organizations, this could be as simple as putting it in a spreadsheet so you've got it somewhere. Some of the places that are more, more um, complex, there's software that can actually do inventories and go out and see what's attached to your network and, and maintain that inventory for you. But once you have that inventory, then you can say, okay, here's the systems we got in place. Are there patches for this middle section, patch manager, are there patches that we need to apply and, and make sure we're looking at that on a monthly basis because vendors are gonna say, hey, here's a new update. Here's something else that needs to be applied. And as best you can, implement a process that automatically updates those so the, the software that you've got. So we've identified the software, We've got a process in place for updating any, um, any known vulnerabilities or any patches that the vendors have put out. And now, once you've got those two in place, now you can begin a process of doing vulnerability scanning on a regular basis. This is sort of your protection. This is your coverall. We've got a patch management pro process in place. Let's run the vulnerability scans 
on a monthly, quarterly, just whatever cadence you can work out, begin running vulnerability scans to identify, well, do we miss a patch? Do we have other issues like maybe we've misconfigured a, a server that has left us open to a vulnerability? There's software out there that can scan networks and begin identifying these vulnerabilities and, and help you, you know, pick up a patch you might have missed, reconfigure a server so that it's more secure. And, and vulnerability scanning is something you want to, uh, it, it's, it's not difficult, but you want to have someone experienced at least setting you up initially to understand what is the vulnerabilities we're seeing and what is the impact of these vulnerabilities. The way, one way you can really look at these vulnerabilities is they're sort of, you look at vulnerabilities sort of from an internal and an external perspective. Well, what does our network look like from the outside? Is someone trying to get in? And what does it look like inside? And so I wanted to just kind of talk about these two uh, ways of doing vulnerability scanning. The first is uh, a network penetration test. The idea here is we're going to do try to do exactly what a hacker does. We're going to scan a network. We're going to look for vulnerabilities and see if we could exploit those. And so if you have someone come in and do a vulnerability or a net network penetration test, they're going to provide you a list of vulnerabilities, and they're going to give you recommendations and help you understand your risk, and, and they'll let you see what a hacker can see from outside your network. The other side of that vulnerability scan is an internal vulnerability scan, saying, well, what does our look like, network look like from the inside? And, and so if I was a hacker and I did get in your network, what could I exploit? How, how well could malware be pushed around my network uh, and, and, create, uh, and create infections? So the, you can think about vulnerability scanning as really two buckets, external penetration testing and internal vulnerability scan. There's a lot of nuances to it, but those are really the ways to start looking at your network once you set up the patch management and you feel like you have a good inventory of your systems. The second, the second uh, process to put in place, key process, is, um, is incident response and getting a retainer in place. The idea here is uh, the worst time in the world to think about what we're gonna do if an incident occurs is when that incident occurs. And so we need to get everything set up ahead of time so that when we do have an incident, we're ready to hit the ground running. These include things like having an incident response policy in place that identifies key stakeholders. Uh, you've done an impact and analysis. You recognize, well, what are the things we need to bring up first if we did get an incident? Was our, is our email system most important? Is our financial system most important? Uh, what is the order in which we want to make sure we get things set up? And who should we be contacting? What, what's the, should we contact our lawyer first? Should we contact our incident response people first? All that should be laid out in an IR policy. You should also do training, tabletop exercises conducted at least on an annual basis. And, and these are great exercises that help organizations kind of walk through what would happen. Let's say uh, we get infected with malware and our CIO or our IT director is on vacation. We can't reach him. What do we do? Who do we call? And you've got the right people sitting on the table and you walk through what the response would be. And then you can kind of do a debrief afterwards and say, how do we do? What would we have done differently? Uh, so the, the IR training is important in being able to be prepared for a, a, a breach. If it comes, we've already tried it. We've already seen what, how we would respond so we know. And lastly, getting an IR retainer in place. Again, this is working with an incident response provider who understands your network already. If you've got a retainer in place, they usually come in, they'll done some analysis, they understand how you operate, and they'll uh, and you get them approved by your insurer. That way, if there's a, an incident, they can come in immediately and hit the ground running, and you're not trying to ramp up or, um, or, or help educate them on how your network works. So the whole idea here with this incident response process is make sure we're ready, make sure we've got the right things in place. Um, Calvin, anything else on that? Uh, just uh, um, on incident response and retainers? No, just make sure you have somebody that's qualified and understand the difference between um, what we would call an IT response versus a forensics response. Uh, an IT response is gonna help you identify the machine uh, that's infected and get it rebuilt and put back into operations. Uh, the a forensics response is going to be there to help you with all your regulatory compliance issues that you've got to deal with, uh, all the laws that you have to comply with, and then potential uh, litigation further down the road. Because if you suffer a breach, it's highly likely you're going to find yourself in some type of litigation at some point in the future. So handling it properly is going to be key. So make sure you got the right uh, IR, uh, you know, incident response service provider. Um, and, and just to, for your information, we do provide a, uh, an incident response retainer. We actually have, actually have a bronze level retainer that um, we can come in and for no cost. Uh, we can get you signed on for one year retainer. Uh, there's an assess assessment that's done with that. But that, again, that helps you. And it's critical to helping you be ready for when there's a, a when an incident does occur. The last critical process we're going to talk about is training and awareness. And this is the idea 
we talked about earlier, where your people are your biggest risk. So how do we begin to educate them? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to make sure you have policies in place. You have expectations set. Those security, cybersecurity policies, you know, I, I spent the, the first 10 years of my, uh, my career working, doing consulting for the federal government, helping them uh, understand their cybersecurity risks. And if there's any organization that knows how to write a huge policy that nobody reads, it's the federal government. I can't tell you how many 500 page cybersecurity policies I was handed. And, and that doesn't do anybody any good. The key is making sure the cybersecurity policy is, is readable and, and, and digestible by the people who need to use it. So when we come and help organizations write cybersecurity policies, it, very often it's a 10 page policy or less because we want it to focus on the key cybersecurity activities that are gonna help mitigate risk. So this is the cybersecurity policy. It's, um, it, it's, it's something that should be tailored to your organization. It's not just a, a template. You'll start with a template, but you'll build it based on what your organization needs. Uh, and then once you've got that cybersecurity policy in place, well, oftentimes it's more information that the general, than what a general user needs. We're gonna have a lot of things in there about, well, how you minister access and how do you make sure changes are done correctly. Users, general users don't need to know that. So we pull out of the cybersecurity policy just those things that general users need to, 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 to know, and we call it our acceptable use policy. We give that to every user, and the users all are educated on what their responsibilities, um, and it increases their, their, their awareness. They, they've got to sign that acceptable use policy and saying they'll abide by the rules of the system. And so you've got this overarching cybersecurity policy, that, and then you've got an acceptable use policy that's given to each user. And then once you've got these things in place, you you conduct security training. You actually sit people down or you give them an online training course and, and you help them identify what their roles are, help them educate them on what their roles are when it comes to cybersecurity because we're all in this together. And, and I, I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the risks I, I see in fairs for a lot of organizations is they're going to say, yes, we need some security awareness training, but it's not a top-down approach and leadership doesn't uh, get on board with the importance of this. They don't recognize that as Calvin talked about earlier, there are some of the biggest risks out there. This is executives and ownership of the dealerships. And, and so it's important that they have the training too and they understand what their roles are. So getting, getting the policies in place, making sure people understand their roles and responsibilities, that's that third critical process. <clears throat> the, as far as the training is concerned, there's lots of different avenues. We provide online training. Uh, there's, uh, you know, we try to tailor those to the organization, not just best practices, but to your security policy. And it's going to be critical for your organization to defend against risks, is getting those people educated. The last stage is really looking at things that are specific to how you do business. And, and so I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but just kind of note that if you do a lot of email and you send a lot of sensitive information over email, you really should be looking at an encrypted email solution. Email by itself is not secure. Once it leaves your network, Email can be read by anybody who can intercept that traffic. And so um, don't fool yourself thinking that oh, I'm sending this email with, a, with some financial data to a customer or I'm asking them to submit their financial information through email. That's available to anybody who can, who can pick that up. It's not encrypted. So providing for your employees and your customers an encrypted email solution is going to be important. Mobile device management. We see a lot of dealerships moving towards having pads uh, or notepads uh, that, that um, that, that uh, salespeople can have out there to look up information, uh, people using their phone to, to look up information online or through the, through the network. But um, mobile devices by themselves pose a significant risk to your organization. Um, they, if you, that phone gets left at a, uh, at a, or that tablet gets left at a restaurant, someone can pick that up, but if it's not secure, they can, um, they can pull the data off of there and you can really compromise some information. So, uh, there are solutions you can put in place to, for mobile device management that help secure those. And lastly, VPN, if you've got users who work off-site, putting in a VPN so that they, this is a virtual private network, it just creates a crypto tunnel between their home computer and your network. And this is the time I'm just going to kind of briefly say, monitoring is very complicated. It's a very difficult thing to do. It, it is an incredibly important thing for organizations to reduce their risk, uh, but find somebody who understands how to set it up because it is very complicated. And you can spend a lot of time and money. I've seen a lot of companies spend a lot of time and money on monitoring and fail uh, because it was such an undertaking. But there's people who understand how to set up networks how, for monitoring, uh, know how to, what points to, to, to monitor, what to look for, and they can make it successful. But, um, but if you do a lot of, uh, if you have a very complicated network, uh, you should really be looking at uh, bringing someone in to help you set up network monitoring.
All right, last polling question. Does your company have a plan in place to increase of the security of the business and its users? Yes, no, not sure. Yes, but we need assistance and so be willing to touch with, <laughs> be in touch with Ike Bailey. You know, while we're finishing that up, I will say, if anybody's interested, we do offer a, a free risk assessment that will evaluate your organization against this best practices approach and will help you identify where there are potential risks and, and if you, um, and, and kind of steps you can take to begin reducing your risk. So um, if you are interested, let us know. Again, that's a, a no cost risk assessment. We can help you begin to identify those risks. All right. I think from the results there, uh, we can see that we're, everybody kind of has some idea of where they want to go. I think that's all we've got for you today. If you've got any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, there's our contact information. I didn't see anything come up in the chat here, but we appreciate your time. Amy, anything else? No, that is it. Thank you all so much for participating and thank you to our presenters and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.